Hello, dear people of God. Pastor Bird here, still managing the feathers within the bird's nest. And looking forward to continuing our study in the Canons of Dort. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to look at Articles 11 and 12. So let's ask for the King's blessing, and then we'll get to work. So pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can study the canons. We are thankful for the way they very helpfully reflect and summarize the truths of your word. And we're thankful that they help us to understand your glorious gospel more and more. And we pray that that would be a comfort to us, a deep, deep comfort to us to better know your gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you don't mind that I've been using a fair amount of hymnody in my recent teaching. But I've been listening to a lot of music over the past few weeks, and hymns have been on the brain. And just so you know, and so that I don't come off as sounding too sanctified, I've also enjoyed uh, big band music, classic rock, but hymns have really been on the brain. Lots of hymns. One of the great hymn writers is Augustus Toplady. He was a contemporary of John Wesley, and they often weren't very kind to one another. One of the things Toplady was, was frustrated by is that a lot of hymnody that was coming out in his day was, well, decidedly Arminian. And one of the things Toplady sought to do was to write hymnody from a distinctly reformed perspective. And one of those hymns is one we sing quite often, How Vast the Benefits Divine. I want you to listen to a couple verses as I read them. How vast the benefits divine which we in Christ possess. We are redeemed from sin and shame and called to holiness. Tis not for works that we've done. These all to him we owe, but he of his electing love salvation does bestow. Safe in the arms of sovereign love, we e'er shall remain, nor shall the rage of earth or hell make thy sure counsel vain. Not one of all the chosen race, but shall to heaven attain. Here they will share abounding grace, and there would Jesus reign. And this is just where our study in the canons of Dort is bringing us, to a sure and humble assurance that the doctrine of election provides the people of God. And this is something important to keep in mind. The canons aren't simply good theology, although they certainly are good theology. It's also pastoral, biblical theology that deals with the real issues that confront God's people. And every genuine believer has times when they struggle with assurance. Sometimes it's after you've willfully sinned. Sometimes it's when you've given in once more to a besetting sin. Or maybe it's after a period of apathy, a spiritual life that's best described by the word blah. And you ask, am I really a Christian? Can God's grace really be for me with all that I've done or all that I've not done? Have I out sinned God's patience and kindness? Was I really never one of his children, one of his chosen? And the Reformed Church knew that kind of thinking could wreak spiritual havoc among the people of God. So they wanted to give God's people an appropriate gospel assurance. And this was over and against the Remonstrants or, or the Arminians who, who were teaching and uh, that you could essentially be saved one day and unsaved the next. You were elect on Monday and a reprobate on Tuesday. And if you read the, the sixth rejection of errors, you've noticed that it works out the implications of this. By this gross error, they made God changeable, destroy the comfort 
of the godly concerning the steadfastness of their election and contradict the Holy Scriptures, which teach that the elect cannot be led astray and that Christ does not lose those given to him by the Father. So the error that they're addressing and want to address has at least three parts. They, they make God changeable. <laughs> they shatter God's intended comfort to his people. And they wrongly interpret the Bible. And so Article 11, it, it actually makes the connection between God's nature and his decree of election. He's unchangeable. He's immutable. And therefore his decision to choose a particular people has to be unchangeable. It says in Article 11 that God's sovereign and gracious choice can neither be suspended nor altered, revoked, or annulled. Neither can his chosen ones be cast off, nor their number reduced. Now this helps us address an aspect of Arminian theology that sometimes slips past us. If man is the one who ultimately chooses, and they could just as sure unchoose, you end up leaving God to flap in the wind, simply reacting and keeping up with the different decisions we have on different days, constantly changing what he's doing based on what we're doing. And let that sink in. If a person could really truly believe now, but, but later truly not believe, that would mean a whole host of heavenly graces. Graces that take place in heaven would have to be undone, would have to be changed. Let me give you one example. How, how do they deal with the doctrine of regeneration? Jesus said in Nicodem uh, excuse me, said in John 3 3 to Nicodemus, uh, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verses 7 and 8 of John 3, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. So regeneration is necessary to see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. And this new birth is the operation of the Spirit that, that's like the wind. It blows wherever it wants to. It's invisible and it's sovereign. But if you decide to stop believing, what happens? Are, are, are you now unborn? Can you all of a sudden no longer see the kingdom? Do you have the power to huff and puff and blow the Spirit right out of you? Or, or think how that would be applied to a text like Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So if you were really saved on Monday, but on Thursday you decided you were just totally done with all this salvation stuff, what does that mean? Can, can we say, yeah, that was a great love with which he loved me, but not quite great enough? Sorry, God, my desires are way too powerful, more powerful even than your love. And, and if that were the case, what does God then do? Does he kill our spirit? Does he, does he cause us to go back to being dead in trespasses and sin? And what about my place in the heavenly places? Is that now filled with somebody else? Did they get my spot or do they just hang a vacant sign over my spot in case I decide I want to come back? There are a lot of examples that show if this could actually happen, if a genuine believer could have eternal life taken from him or lose it or find a way to get rid of it, it would mean that many sovereign heavenly graces were overturned and reversed. And that would mean our change of decision would bring about a change in God. 
And that's hugely problematic because it does violence to the doctrine of God, a God who is unchanging. Now, thankfully, the canons won't let us go there. God himself, it tells us, is most wise, unchangeable, all-knowing, and almighty. And no creature then can usurp his wisdom, force him to change his direction, overrule his knowing, or thankfully out-wrestle the almighty. And that brings us to Article 12 and, and the pastoral comfort that our election brings us. And we need to know the Reformed Doctrine of Assurance was a biblical teaching that was under fierce attack, first by the Roman Catholic Church. This is how they responded to the Reformation teaching on assurance when they met for the Council of Trent to oppose the Reformation. No one, moreover, so long as he's in this mortal life, ought so far to presume as regards the secret mystery of divine predestination as to determine for certain that he's assuredly and the number of the predestinate. And then the Arminians come along some 250-ish years later and say, in this life there is no fruit, no awareness, no assurance of one's unchangeable election to glory. In other words, both Rome and the Arminians want to say, you can't really know for sure. And again, pastorally, it's not hard to understand how much anxiety that can create in people. If you or a loved one has ever had a serious medical condition and you've had to wait for test results, then you know the worst part of the process is waiting and not knowing. It's waiting and a lack of certainty about the future. <laughs> How much more anxiety does that produce in a person if you're waiting and unsure about your eternal future? See, the authors of the canons wanted believers to have the assurance that God's word intends for God's people to have. And I know there are some who presume upon the doctrine of assurance, and I'll touch on that in a minute. They use it like a bit of eternal life insurance, but the canons actually address that as well. Follow along as I read Article 12. Assurance of this, their eternal and unchangeable election to salvation, is given to the chosen in due time, though by various stages and in different measures. Such assurance comes not by inquisitive searching into the hidden and deep things of God, but by noticing within themselves with spiritual joy and holy delight the unmistakable fruits of election pointed out in God's word, such as true faith in Christ, a childlike fear of God, a godly sorrow for their sins, and a hunger and thirst for righteousness, and so on. Now this, again, begins with something that, if we're not careful, we can easily miss. Assurance isn't necessarily an immediate fruit of a person's faith. It's not a given that you believe in the morning and by the afternoon you're going to have an unshakable confidence. And I know this sort of flies in the face of a kind of evangelism that, that, that gets a person to pray a prayer or walk down an aisle or sign a card and then they're told, write the date you did this thing in the back of your Bible and if anyone ever suggests you're not saved, you just point them to the date. Canons helpfully don't use point to the date in your Bible as a root of your election. And in case you're wondering, yes, I have experienced that. And to my embarrassment, I've even done that. But that's not assurance of God's gracious election. That is presumption. The canons give us real balance here. Notice how careful their language is. Assurance is given in due time time. It's a fruit of mature, uh, a mature Christian growing in faith. Now why do they say this? And it's because they're seeking to be biblically balanced. Jesus promised in John 5 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death 
into life. So when a person believes you're dealing with one of those heavenly graces that can never be undone. But Jesus also taught in Mark 4 that some people will have a superficial faith. They'll hear his word. They'll have some initial gladness to it. But they're not grounded in him. They're not rooted in him. And time and, and difficult circumstances will prove that they didn't actually have saving faith. And they'll fall away. And this is why it's, it's not only a grievous error to deny God's people the blessing of assurance. It's also a grievous error to offer assurance where it's unwarranted. Which is why the apostles would tell us to be diligent to confirm your calling and election, and to test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Now, the question still remains, how do I know I'm elect? And interestingly, the canon begins by telling us that's the wrong question to ask. It's a good and proper thing for God's people to have assurance of their salvation and to grow in that confidence, but it doesn't happen by trying to figure out the secret counsel of God's eternal decrees. The canons instead give us helpful marks that can strengthen our assurance. First and most obvious is, do you trust in Christ alone for your salvation? Do you believe the promises of the gospel? Does it bring you joy and consolation to know that your sins are forgiven? That in Christ, those sins have been separated from you as far as the east is from the west? Do you delight in knowing that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? You see, knowing that, believing that, trusting that, that's the chief and choicest fruit of our election. And think about it, dear ones. The Apostle Paul, who taught the doctrine of election with great precision, never wrote, if you find out you're elect, you'll be saved. No, no. He said in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So the first and absolutely essential mark of being a genuine Christian and growing in assurance is believing the promises of the biblical gospel. Also, do you have a reverential fear of God? Not, not like a fear of a tyrant or a dictator, but a holy esteem and an honor for your heavenly Father. You have godly sorrow when you sin? Does it actually break you to know you violated God's law? You've gone against your Father's will. Do you have an earnest desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, those are the telltale signs of saving faith and the telltale signs that you're an elect of God. Do you believe? And I know when we're going through an especially hard time or if our spiritual life seems stale, maybe due to an intense battle with sin, we can have a tendency to ask that question. How could I be a Christian? Here's the main thing. Do these times always bring you back to Christ? That's the issue. When the Apostle Paul, as a mature believer, considered his own life in relationship to the standard of God's law. Do you remember what he cried out in Romans 7, 24? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then in verse 25 wrote this, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. As a Christian, you'll struggle with sin and complacency and doubts, and it'll feel like a war in your soul. But if those things are always bringing you back to the foot of Christ, to the feet of Christ, seeking His mercy, drinking deeply of His grace, then you can be confident 
that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Well, as always, dear brothers and sisters, don't hesitate to ask questions or post comments, blessings, and amen.